Warning, the following covers House of Mystery, a comic published by DC under its mature reader's imprint, Vertigo. While any scenes of nudity have been removed, the book still contains sexual references, foul language, and graphic violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Also, my camera picked up a strange glare, which is why every on-camera segment after the second one is shot at a different angle. In an attempt to cash in on the horror comics craze of the 1950s, DC Comics would have launched two competing anthology books, one called House of Secrets and the other called House of Mystery. After the backlash against horror comics and the introduction of the Comics Code Authority, the two books would go through a genre change, focusing on mystery and fantasy, respectively. They would also gain hosts along the way, with House of Mystery being hosted by Kane and House of Secrets being hosted by Abel. The books would run throughout most of the 60s and 70s, with House of Mystery featuring many of the solo adventures of Justice League member the Martian Manhunter, and House of Secrets being known as the debut book for the DC character Swamp Thing. House of Secrets would come to an end in 1978, while House of Mystery continued on until 1983, before getting a brief revival in 1986 in which Kane mysteriously disappeared and hosting duties were turned over to TV star Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. However, this would not be the end for Kane, Abel, or their respective houses. You may recall all of five episodes previously in episode 100 of the Random Trade Review, where we covered Neil Gaiman's Sandman, that Cain and Abel popped up in that series as well, where it was revealed that the houses of both Mystery and Secrets lived in the realm of the Dreaming, where the titular Sandman dwelt. Cain and Abel also took on the characteristics of their biblical namesakes, with Cain constantly killing Abel, who would then be resurrected a mere seconds later, much to the former's chagrin. In 2008, House of Mystery would be revived for DC's Vertigo imprint, by writer Bill Willingham, creator of Vertigo's mega-successful series Fables, and Willingham's co-writer on the spin-off Jack of Fables, Matthew, nay Lila Sturgis. The series would contain an ongoing plot thread while still retaining elements of the previous anthology. And today we're looking at the collection of the first volume of House of Mystery. This is House of Mystery, Room and Boredom. At the House of Secrets, Kane calmly slips his last bit of tea after killing Abel with an axe. He criticizes his brother's move towards low-calorie tea time fare, promising a much better tea party tomorrow. He then exits the house to return home, only to discover that the House of Mystery has completely vanished. Jumping ahead seven years, a woman named Bethany Keel, a.k.a. Fig, runs through the streets of Austin, Texas. She's fleeing two mysteriously cloaked strangers who have destroyed Fig's childhood home and set it on fire. The two ethereal beings float above the ground, telling Fig that there is no way to escape. Fig, an amateur architect, clutches on to a set of mysterious blueprints of a house she dreamt of since childhood as she ducks into the back door of a nearby bar. Inside the bar, the patrons are throwing a goodbye party for a staff member named Rita. Rita bids farewell to her co-workers as a masked coachman arrives to take her away. The bar staff, who along with Fig consists of the main cast of this series, consists of bartender Harry Bailey, a waitress named Cressidia, or just Cress for short, an ex-pirate turned bouncer named Anne Preston, and a poet named... well, Poet. The group returns to work, where a woman named Sally has garnered much of the attention of the attendees of the bar as she voraciously wolfs down several large meals. Sally is worried about how she's exactly going to cover her meal tab, but Harry points out the currency accepted in this establishment is a story. With that, Sally begins her tale. Sally grew up a bell in a typical southern city, with the one difference being is that most of the eligible bachelors were in fact giant flies. The most eligible of the Dipteran bachelors became the apple of Sally's eye, and the two soon wound up getting married, with Sally getting pregnant soon thereafter. Sally gave birth to over a hundred maggot babies which sprung forth from her back, and afterwards they metamorphosed into flies and left without saying much of a goodbye. This left Sally with a bit of an empty feeling. Chalking her feelings of emptiness up to postpartum depression, Sally got a divorce and has been searching a way to regain substance in her life ever since. It's then that we get a bit of revelation as to maybe why Sally feels so empty and why it is she's been getting so much attention at the bar. Harry's pleased enough with the story, pointing out that next time Sally could just make something up and offers her a permanent spot. 
along the back wall. As for Fig, she begins stumbling around the back of the bar when she realizes something. She has somehow entered the house from her blueprints, the one from her childhood dreams. It's then that the door to the bar opens, and Cress welcomes Fig to the house of mystery. Fig sits down and orders a fairly strong cocktail as Cress explains what the house is. The House of Mystery is a meeting nexus for several parallel dimensions with a fully stocked bar, and they are willing to serve any meal as long as it's not still living. Also, Monday is ladies' nights. The two are then interrupted by the arrival of a consigliere named Enrico Canapazzo, and he has a story to tell. Canapazzo is considered the greatest process server who ever lived. He's so in demand that he even gets dispatched to an underwater civilization located in a Lovecraftian world. Ever determined to complete his task, Canapazzo underwent a surgical procedure that temporarily turned him into a merman. He then proceeded to go underwater and deliver the summons, convincing several lower security guards to unionize along the way. Cress prepares to serve Canapazzo his drink, but he's actually here on business. A bar patron named Tomas Nicholas is being served with divorce papers. Meanwhile, Harry gives Fig a tour of the house, which upsets Cress as the last person to receive such tour was her, and it didn't end very well. Harry takes Fig out to a viewing terrace overlooking a nearby ocean complete with a sea monster. It's then that Fig explains how it is she got here. Fig was sitting in her old bedroom when two people mysteriously appeared out of nowhere. The house then began collapsing around her. She began running away, but the creepy couple pursued her until she wound up in the house of mystery. Harry suggests telling such a story to the bar, which angers Fig, as this isn't for anyone's amusement, and she storms off. Fig marches all the way through the bar and out the front door, where she finds that she's no longer in Austin, Texas, but instead a desolate wasteland. Harry, Poet, Cress, and Anne then appear to explain that Fig is like them. She's now trapped in the house of mystery, and she won't be able to leave unless the coachman comes for her. Fig starts to feel lightheaded as she tries to explain that she designed the house, but no one believes her. Harry and Cress take Fig up to a floor, which just suddenly appeared. The two then set Fig down on a bed, where she falls asleep fully clothed shortly thereafter. The next day, Fig wakes up to find her jeans sitting on the floor. Seriously, issue two ends with Fig clearly crawling under the covers and falling asleep while wearing her jeans. And then issue three begins with Fig only clad in a t-shirt and her jeans lying on the floor. Fig begins hearing a mysterious voice in her head that isn't hers as she checks the closet to find it fully stocked, though she decides to stay in her regular outfit. She bumps into Poet, who takes her outside for breakfast, but she's not determined to stay too long as she starts heading towards the front gate of the house and trying to climb it. All that happens is that she winds up falling back into the front lawn after reaching the top, and then suggests an alternate route by taking a small boat that's located on the cliffside overlooking the ocean. The one hitch is that Fig has to lower her down on a rope in order to get to the boat. Meanwhile, in the bar, a mobster named Spazioli regales everyone with his story. He was tricked by a rival crime boss who then chained Spazioli up in the basement of a mansion stripped down to his underwear. However, Spazioli was chained a little too close to the furnace as he broke off a gas pipe to free himself. He then took down several goons before taking down the rival boss after he opened fire in the room full of gas. Somehow, Spazioli got out unscathed. As the story concludes, Fig walks through the bar carrying a ladder as she chickened out and going over the cliffside. Harry tries to stop her, but it turns out Cress tipped Fig off about Rena, the woman from the party earlier, and how she was like Fig, Harry, and the others, but she got to leave. Fig tries scaling the outer wall of the house and gets to the top, only to find the bones of several large creatures before some strange force knocks her off and backwards into Harry's arms. A bit more resigned to her fate, Fig returns to the bar. It's then that we get an update on Rena, who is actually still with the coachman, who isn't actually driving the horses. Instead, he's just berating her with constant questions about the house, like if it's creaking or not. Questions that she doesn't know the answer to. The coachman gives up and just casts Rena out into the wasteland. Spoilers, it's Kane. Fig continues to struggle accepting her new lot in life, and Cress isn't really helping by telling bar patrons that Fig is the new waitress. Fig still thinks she can somehow escape this and begins arguing with Cress with Harry trying to play peacemaker. Anyway, the bar has a new patron, a young lady with a talking snow leopard named Floyd. The woman is a princess from the Summerlands, and her mother's kingdom is at war with an insurgent army led by someone called the Thinking Man, who's taken over the populace with a series of mind worms. In order to avoid detection of those mind worms, the queen wiped the princess' memory and sent her to San Francisco. When all is safe, the queen will call for the princess by returning her name to her via love's first kiss. Shortly after arriving in San Francisco, the princess sets out looking for true love. And, as to be somewhat expected, a bunch of douchey guys wind up using this as an excuse to just have sex with her. However, the joke turns out to be on them, as shortly after breaking the princess's heart, Floyd comes in and devours them. There was one exception, a guy named Mark, who really did seem to treat the princess with some respect, dignity, and love. Unfortunately, before the two could declare their love for each other, Floyd killed Mark. When asked why, Floyd pointed out the obvious. Sure, 
things might be safe in the kingdom now, but what happens the next time a threat comes along? The princess could be right back at square one. As long as she stays in San Francisco, not knowing her name, she's always safe. The princess was convinced enough to stay in San Francisco without learning her name, but she does occasionally fool around on the side. That is, until Floyd gets hungry. After closing time, Harry and the others invite Fig into the basement to partake in one of their favorite activities, smashing relics. It's okay because the relics repair themselves within a matter of hours. She's willing to join in until Harry mentions once more that Fig can't leave. This causes Fig to snap and begin bashing the basement walls and demanding to be let go. It's then that the House of Mystery begins collapsing around everyone. It's here we get a glimpse into the backstory behind Bethany Fig Keel. Fig grew up the child of a writer who used her as the basis for a series of popular children's adventure books. However, soon her parents divorced and the book series came to an end where her father tried a failed attempt at science fiction. It's around this time that Fig began hearing houses begin talking to her. It's also the time she began dreaming about and thus designing the House of Mystery. She tried to become an architect at college but flamed out as she was in love with the artistry of being an architect but not exactly the technicality about becoming an architect. She also tried to reconnect with her father but at this point he became a washed out pothead. And it's here that we begin to lead into the events of the story with the ghostly couple and the collapsing houses and all that jazz. Harry gets clobbered by a falling beam as everyone tries to get to safety. Fig, believing that she knows the way out because she designed the house, tries to lead everyone. However, everyone just winds up getting stuck in a weird Escher-esque labyrinth. Fig blames herself, feeling that her actions broke the house's heart. The effects are even being felt in the bar, where Jordan, a young man who voluntarily does odds and ends around the place, and a patron who fell asleep in the men's room are resigned to their fate. Jordan tries hand at telling his story. He woke up late for work and had to sprint through New York City. Not our New York City, mind you, but one with mythical creatures like dragons, goblins, elves, and... Oh my god, this is where they got the idea for Bright. Back with Fig and the others, she pleads with the house to spare everyone else as they don't really deserve to die. The house relents as long as Fig leaves and never comes back, with a door magically appearing out of nowhere. Harry pleads with Fig, but she opens the door and exits, only to find someone waiting on the other side for her. And that concludes House of Mystery, Volume 1, Room and Boredom. How was it? Well, for the most part, it's actually really good. Uh, I think there's some really nice artwork throughout all of this story, and I do like how it pays tribute to the original House of Mystery anthology with the idea of the bar patrons telling stories. Also, I think Fig is a very interesting character. Now, on the downside, while I did like the idea of the bar patrons telling the stories, the stories themselves are pretty weak. Uh, the only one I could say I outright liked was the one about Princess and Floyd, and that was kind of it. Also, the supporting cast is, well, really underdeveloped. I mean, there's kind of some hints in through here, like Cress and Harry may have had some type of romance. Also, Harry and Rena may have had some type of romance because apparently Harry just likes to kind of bed the new girl. Also, I know nothing about Anne or Poet. They are completely vestigial at this point. Now, granted, maybe that happens in later volumes, but I can't say for certain. But other than that, this is fairly enjoyable, so I am going to give House of Mystery Volume 1, Room and Boredom, a B. And with that, let's see what we'll be doing next time on the Random Trade Review. patreon.com slash sleepy time for cat productions where you can request a trade to be placed in the randomizer aka the cardboard box